The Senior Rehab Podcast is sponsored by great seminars and books. If you need high-quality geriatric con ed that's worth your time and money, check out Great. Owned by the living legend, Carol Lewis, Great offers courses and products created by recognized leaders in geriatrics. Learn the most effective techniques for diagnosing and treating your patients. Just go to SeniorRehabProject.com forward slash Great and get $25 off by using the code SRP25. The show is also sponsored by you, the listener. Go to SeniorRehabProject.com forward slash join to find out how you can help steer the direction of this movement and join our monthly meetup. Once again, that is SeniorRehabProject.com forward slash join. Hit me. Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. The podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. This is Senior Rehab Shorts, the evidence-based segment for geriatric rehab clinicians, bringing you relevant and applicable content to better serve your patients, regardless of your setting. And now your host, Joe Daniels. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Shorts. I'm really excited to bring to you guys um, a paper this week. It's a special interest paper out of the Journal of Geriatric Physical Therapy from 2014 uh, with regards to depression in older adults um, and how to go about appropriate screening and referral. And it's titled exactly that, Depression in Older Adults, Screening and Referral by Vieira et al., um, You know, I'm really passionate about this topic, not only with the older adult, but in general, um, as someone whose whose father dealt with mental illness and depression their entire life, for the most part, um, it's it's something that's near and dear to my heart, and even more so with the older adult, as wide and as prevalent as it is in this population, I really don't think we do a good enough job as PTs or healthcare providers in general um, to be recognizing depression and and depressive episodes and making the appropriate um, screenings and referrals uh, to get these these folks the help that they that they need and that they deserve okay and so I'll give you guys some brief introductory information here on um, depression in the older adult and then we'll get right into it in terms of how we need to be screening and referring out to the appropriate provider So depression in older adults is obviously associated with emotional suffering, increases in healthcare expenditures, uh, morbidity, higher risk of suicide, and mortality from other causes. Major depression was identified by the World Health Organization as the fourth leading cause of disease. The cause of depression is poorly understood, but it is associated with changes in neurochemicals in the brain. Risk factors for depression include genetics, medical conditions, functional decline, disability, social isolation, and psychological stressors. Stressors. Many of these factors are common among older adults. Major depressive disorder, or MDD, is a chronic form of severe depression with an episodic course which is prevalent in older adults. It's characterized by a number of persistent signs and symptoms independently of age. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, for a patient to be classified as having MDD, he or she must present with sad mood and or decreased interest or pleasure in activities and present with at least four or more of the following symptoms most of the day, nearly every day, for a minimum of two weeks. Okay, So significant changes in appetite or weight, sleep disturbances, restlessness or sluggishness, fatigue or loss of energy, lack of concentration or indecision, feelings of worthlessness or inappropriate guilt, and thoughts of death or suicide. So that's major depressive disorder, guys. And the prevalence of MDD increases across the continuum of settings as limitations in illness increase. Major depressive disorder accounts for 0.7 to 1.4 of community dwellers, 6 to 9% of primary care patients, 14% of older adults receiving home care, and 25%, guys, of nursing home residents. MDD, 25% of nursing home residents. That's one in four. The increasing prevalence of MDD is consistent with the increase in limitations and illness across these settings. Therefore, not surprisingly, depression in older adults is associated with falls. It is common after stroke and other conditions that result in functional impairment and is associated with activity limitations, 
participation restrictions, and reduce quality of life. Depression among patients with stroke is associated with increased length of stay, less efficient use of rehab services, and higher 12-month mortality rates. Thus, depression detection and referral are important components of care. So check this out, guys. According to the 2011 American Physical Therapy Association on geriatric guidelines on essential competencies in the care of older adults, physical therapists should be able to 1. Select and administer tests for cognition and depression, i.e. mini mental state exam, geriatric depression scale, clock drawing test, etc. 2. Differentiate between depression, delirium, and dementia on the basis of symptoms and comorbidities. 3. Adapt and modify communication and care delivery as needed. And 4. Determine need for referral. Now think about that, guys. How many of you can 100% confidently say that you are able to do those things? Just some food for thought for the time being. However, many physical therapists may not be prepared to implement depression screening activities that require organizational, organizational commitment and leaders to encourage and support the effort. A survey study evaluated the ability of 20 physical and 8 occupational therapists to recognize cognitive and affective disorders among 102 newly admitted geriatric patients. The physical and occupational therapists had difficulty identifying patients with cognitive and affective disorders. Although formal diagnosis of depression is not part of the role of these healthcare professionals, they are well positioned to improve detection and referral for suspected cases of depression in older adults. So in this article, guys, they provide an overview of an evidence-based approach for screening of suspected cases of depression in older adults by PTs and other non-mental health professionals and procedures to refer to the suspected case primary care providers and or mental health specialists for evaluation. Also, the content of this article is important to PTs because Unrecognized and undertreated depression is in older adults is a significant public health problem, and older adults are often reluctant to seek care for mental health problems. Men medical costs for depressed older adults are estimated to be 50% higher, guys, 50% higher than those of non-depressed older adults. Physical therapists provide care for a growing number of older adults. However, a number of barriers for depression recognition exist. So in terms of depression screening, screening patients for depression can help identify older adults in need of interventions and lead to improvements in their well-being and overall clinical status. Brief screens can be administered at minimal personnel cost and may lead to a decrease in overall healthcare costs. So obviously a number of barriers for depression recognition exist in the older adult population, including the misperception that depression occurs inevitably as a result of aging or medical illness and as such is not treatable, which is simply not true. Screening activities do require training and practice as detection of depression symptoms, as we just saw in the example, is often complicated by coexisting medical illness, pain, cognitive impairment, anxiety, and disability in the older adult population. So the U.S. Preventative Task Force, or the USPTF, recommends that all individuals older than 60 years be periodically screened for depression. In terms of a specific approach for depression screening, the USPTF concluded there is little evidence to recommend one screening method over another so clinicians can choose the best method that fits their personal preference, the patient population served, and the practice setting. So this isn't like, you know, full recognition um, scales and, and deciding what we need to use like the article we put out a couple weeks ago. Um, there's currently not best evidence on, on what is, is best to use in terms of mental health and depression recognition. So uh, there's a multitude of tools out there, and it's up to you guys. I'll go through a couple here to determine what it is that you want to use to help um, best identify these folks. So one option for depression screening is the Patient Health Questionnaire 2, or the PHQ-2, which standardizes the assessment of the two cardinal symptoms of major depression depressed mood and lack of interest or pleasure in activities. So patients with the PHQ-2 score of two or three plus, depending on the patient population, should be referred for further evaluation. So scoring involves adding the results from the two items. For example, if a patient reported little interest or pleasure in doing things 
and feeling down, depressed, or hopeless more than half the days over the past two weeks, the total score would be a four. The PHQ-2 with a cutoff score of three has an 87% sensitivity and a 78% specificity for depression. Furthermore, the PHQ-9 may be used in conjunction with the PHQ-2, increasing the reliability and validity of the findings. The PHQ-9 simply extends the PHQ-2 and corresponds to all nine symptoms of major depression. An efficient strategy is to complete the PHQ-2 and then complete the seven remaining symptoms for those with a positive initial screen on the first scoring, that being the PHQ-2. So the PHQ-9 and the cutoff scores are all available online, guys. As with the PHQ-2, like I just mentioned, I'll put everything in the show notes for you guys. So the PHQ-9 scores range from 0 to 27, with an increasing score correlating with increasing depression severity. And each of the nine items is scored from 0 to 3, indicating how often symptoms are bothersome. So a PHQ-9 with a cutoff score of 10 had an 88% sensitivity and an 88% specificity for major depression diagnosis in a large primary care population. So a scale developed specifically for use with the older adults that was found to provide reliable and valid results is the 15-item geriatric depression scale. The, GD, the GDS-15 has a yes-no format and is available in multiple languages. Scores range from 0 to 15, and obviously the higher the score, the more likely the individual is to be experiencing depression. It had been used for community dwelling, hospitalized, and institutionalized older adults, but has diminished value as a depression screen for persons with dementia. The, GT, the GDS-15 with a cutoff score of 6 has a 94% sensitivity and 85% specificity in community dwelling older adults, with a cutoff score of 5 having a 72% sensitivity Sorry, guys, in home care patients. The PHQ-2 and the PHQ-9, along with the GDS-15, can all be administered as self-report or by interview. No matter which approach is used, the cutoff scores indicate when further evaluation by a primary health care provider or mental health care provider is needed. So detection of depression in persons with dementia can be complicated by a number of factors. First, apathy or lack of motivation is common in people with dementia. A lack of motivation does not necessarily indicate a depression disorder, but does limit the person's engagement in activities and can complicate assessment. So in differentiating apathy from depression, the trained clinician should assess the course of symptoms, i.e. abrupt change would be associated with depression, and treatment responses. However, it is often difficult to determine whether cognitive symptoms, i.e. disorientation, apathy, difficulty concentrating, and memory loss are better accounted for by dementia or by a major depressive episode. So many individuals with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia are unable to provide reliable self-reports or emotional symptoms. In addition, caregivers may be unaware of behavioral symptoms associated with depression and may not communicate their observations to other healthcare members of the team. So the Cornell scale for depression and dementia is a validated and reliable depression severity measure. The American Geriatric Society Consensus Statement of 2003 also recommends the CSDD as a screening instrument for depression among moderately to severely cognitively impaired individuals. So the tool has been, value- has been validated to rate depression symptoms over the entire range of cognitive impairment um, and is also administered via two semi-structured interviews, one with an informant and one with the patient. A final decision regarding the presence or absence of symptoms is achieved by the clinician's judgment and integration of both sets of responses. So any clinician delivering the tool can ascertain the presence or absence of depressive symptoms, but then the patient needs to be referred to the appropriate specialist for further evaluation and treatment. So in terms of communicating depression symptoms and related information, guys, who do we, who do we refer to, who do we talk to, who are the appropriate people in this circle? So barriers for depression and evaluation and treatment include failure and efficient failure to efficiently and effectively communicate depression related information, all right? So when making a referral for a positive depression screen, it's important to provide clinical information so an informed decision regarding the next needed action can occur. So the following suggested information um, which is content Organizational format and example come from the Nuts and Bolts Organization for Depression case presentation. 
And so it needs to be structured in a certain way, guys, in terms of how you reach out to the appropriate provider, okay? So you're going to first identify yourself. You know, I'm a PT from so-and-so. Then you're going to identify the patient, state their age, their marital marital status, race, gender, etc. If, you know, the provider doesn't have all this information already, what their current symptoms are, their suicidal ideation, psychiatric history, if any, or psychosocial support, Uh, medical illness and medications, and then recommendation for further evaluation by a physician or a mental health specialist. So here's what that phone call or that conversation should look like. So here's a good example. So hi, I'm Mary Smith from ABC Agency. I'm calling you about your patient, Mr. Arthur Jones, who I suspect has depression. Mr. Jones is a 66-year-old married white male. He reports a depressed mood most days nearly every day for the last six or seven months. He has lost interest in activities such as watching his favorite sporting events. He denies thoughts about death or suicide. He denies any psychiatric history. Mr. Jones is a retired teacher, lives with his wife of 30 years, and underwent bilateral hip replacement two months ago. His medical illnesses include osteoarthritis and diabetes. His medications include Zoloft by mouth every day without side effects and Alprazolam by mouth as needed. Um which he takes once or twice a day. Both were started one month ago at the rehab facility, also taking insulin subcutaneously every day at bedtime, and acetaminophen, two tablets as needed for pain. I would recommend having a psychiatric nurse evaluate the patient. Before using the suggested standardized format, clinicians should first provide their names and the name of the agency of the facility before discussing the individual case. So this case format can also be incorporated in written communication, uh, and clinicians are often surprised are often surprised when using this format by how efficiently they were able to provide the needed inf- information, usually in less than two minutes. All right. So in terms of facilitating referrals, guys, the attitudes and beliefs of the older adult must be considered. Older adults with a positive depression screen may not be motivated i.e. apathy, or reluctant to receive further evaluation. Common concerns are the stigma associated with mental illness, worry about additional treatments, concerns about cost, difficulty with mobility, and limited transportation. In general, older adults often find physical illness to be more acceptable than psychiatric illness, and individuals from different cultural backgrounds may vary in the words of expressions they use to describe their emotions and symptoms. These challenges decrease the likelihood that the older adult will follow through with a mental health referral. Further investigation of a positive screen will determine whether a formal diagnosis of a depressive disorder is present. So when a patient with a currently prescribed antidepressant has a positive depression screen, the clinician may incorrectly assume that further evaluation is not needed. However, a depression screen is clinically meaningful whether or not the patients are taking antidepressants currently. If a patient is still depressed when being treated, it indicates the need to be evaluated as a different treatment approach is indicated. So a good approach to increase the acceptability of further evaluation is to use the language of the patient, i.e. feeling low or down instead of depressed and discuss mental health referral in the context of other medical conditions. For example, post-stroke depression negatively affects functional recovery after discharge. Depressed patients have three times greater odds of being non-compliant with treatment recommendations than non-depressed patients. Thus, proper referral needs to be ensured for optimal recovery and rehabilitation outcomes. Involving family members in the discussion is helpful because spending time with a depressed person can be frustrating and confusing. Family members should be provided with information about the medical illness of depression and its treatment so they know what to expect and can provide support appropriately. A number of resources are available providing targeted family education about depression and its treatment at familyaware.org. That's familyaware.org. In addition, it is critical to use appropriate patient education materials, i.e. targeted to language and health literacy about depression and the need for referral for further evaluation. Patients often need a great deal of encouragement and support to follow through with appointments for mental health issues that they may not feel are essential. 
So adults of all ages often do not receive depression treatment or receive inadequate treatment, resulting in an ongoing depressive episode. 32% of adults or 32% of older adults, 77% of older adults were not receiving depression treatment when needed. Even for those patients being treated with antidepressants, continued monitoring for symptoms and dosage adjustments consistent with evidence-based practice often does not occur. The situation is comparable to starting a blood pressure lowering treatment but not measuring the blood pressure at a later time to see its effect. So in terms of resources, guys, within this paper, there's a great table that presents all these online resources, including information about depression in older adults, performing assessments, patient and family education, making referrals, and depression care. So recognizing the consequences of inadequately, de inadequately treated depression in older adults, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare recently prioritized assessment and care in nursing homes and home care settings. Assessment and management of depression in older adults can be conceptualized in the following four steps, okay? So step one, accurate depression recognition and screening is needed, but assessment is only the first step in caring for depression. Step two, depression-related information needs to be conveyed to the patient's physician and or mental health specialist for further evaluation. Step three, depression treatment needs to be initiated or adjusted as indicated. Step four, which I think is the most important, as the example mentioned previously with the blood pressure, ongoing monitoring of both symptoms and patient adherence to treatment is required. So in conclusion, guys, physical and occupational therapists are well positioned to improve detection and referral suspect for suspected cases of depression in older adults. However, they have difficulty identifying patients with depression. Depression detection and referral are important components of care. Obviously, we hope that this review, and in the words of the authors, we hope that this review will promote the incorporation of evidence-based screening and referral of suspected cases of depression in older adults into routine practice of PTs and other non-mental health professionals. So I think the biggest takeaway from this, guys, is to, to incorporate either the PHQ-2 or the PHQ-9 um, into your screening and your evaluation um, of each and every patient. Um, and so asking, you know, over the last two weeks, have you been bothered by any of the following symptoms? Little interest in pleasure or little interest or pleasure in doing things and feeling down, depressed or hopeless. So more than half the days on either of those Either of those statements, guys, is warrants a further screening for depression, okay? Um, and then from that further screening, um, one would refer out appropriately um, by the method discussed earlier with regards to either the phone call or um, the, documentation, the, the documentation um, format. So either in a written letter or in a phone call or simply a conversation uh, with a physician or a mental health professional if there's one on staff in your facility. Um, so really do your best, guys. Um, depression is obviously important and it's going to affect every aspect of this, this older person's life that you're working with. Um, so we need to be acting accordingly in terms of identifying um, and referring appropriately. All right. So until next time, guys, stay funky. Hit me. Thank you for listening to the Senior Rehab Podcast. I appreciate your time. And if you enjoyed this episode, do me one favor. Share it with one other person that would benefit. Thank you. If you want to see the show notes or find more episodes, just go to SeniorRehabProject.com. And until next time, my friends, do not forget to stay funky. The Senior Rehab Podcast is sponsored by Great Seminars and Books. If you need high-quality geriatric con ed that's worth your time and money, check out Great. Owned by the living legend Carol Lewis, Great offers courses and products created by recognized leaders in geriatrics. Learn the most effective techniques for diagnosing and treating your patients. Just go to SeniorRehabProject.com forward slash Great and get $25 off by using the code SRP25. Oh,
The show is also sponsored by you, the listener. Go to seniorrehabproject.com forward slash join to find out how you can help steer the direction of this movement and join our monthly meetup. Once again, that is seniorrehabproject.com forward slash join.